folks. Well, I see people joining us. So thanks very much for coming out for our newest webinar, Researching Your OTTB. Um, this is a new topic for us this year. So we're looking forward to diving in because there's um, lots of stuff to talk about. So the way we've structured the webinar tonight, um, we'll have roughly two halves. So the first half um, are makeover registrar, um, so our, our makeover data specialist, Sally Roberts. She's going to talk everybody through um, more of the basic stuff on how to use Equibase, how to use Equine Line, on um, some of the other tools at our disposal. Um, so Sally has been with us for a few years now. I think you were on before I joined. but uh, I joined in 2018. I started working for her. Right. Yep. So um, Sally now um, is part-time, but she goes through, and we've mentioned this before, but every single horse that goes into the system, whether it's uh, registered for the makeover or it's going to the thoroughbred sport tracker or it's in the RRP horse listings, Sally goes through and manually verifies all that horse's information. So she knows everything about all of your horses. <laughs> um, so we're going to let her, um, she doesn't really get to interface with the public directly much. So this is kind of fun for us actually to have Sally on to talk about um, the basics on how to get started with researching your OTTB. So if you are new to thoroughbreds, um, this half is definitely for you. So I'm going to let Sally jump right in. She's going to do some screen sharing. Um, and if you guys have any questions, definitely post them in the Zoom chat, in the Q&A, or on Facebook, and we will try to catch them as they come up. All right. Oh, first of all, I've never done one of these before. So uh, like right now, I had like little notes on my laptop, my personal laptop, and it all went blank. So now I'm logging back into my other computer so that I can see my <laughs> Anyway, okay. So um, tonight, yeah, as, as uh, Kristen said, I'm going to talk about mostly Equibase, Equine Line, and the Jockey Club Registry. And I'll talk about how we use them and how, you know, anybody can use them. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about, the, the basic database where the Jockey Club keeps all the racing information about registered thoroughbreds is in Equibase. And this, I'm going to share my screen now and you can see Equibase. Oops. So while Sally's pulling that up too, I'll mention the horses that we're going to be looking at tonight um, are either horses that we own on the panel um, oh, horses that we have permission to look at so we're not like just grabbing random horses and um, diving in actually i think there's a couple that we're going to look at that are registered for the makeover this year so with some yeah. stuff that sally noticed but, but we're but not here anyone's I, dirty laundry so <laughs> right right no they're just they're they're horses that are uh that are being uh, used that are that you know that are that are going to be in the makeover so here is equibase when you when you log into Equibase, this is what you will see. So um, where when you go up to look at a horse up here is the little search field and you can search for horses, jockeys, trainers, owners, tracks, and stakes, but we are always looking at horses. So that's where we keep it. And the first horse we're going to talk about is Regal Justice, RP grad. And so we just type his name in there and boom, First thing you'll see is, oh, there's more than one of them. <laughs> multiple justices. Perfect. There's multiple regal justices. So we know, we know that our regal justice is was a 2018 competitor. So it's more likely that it's this one from 2014 and not the 1997 regal justice. So here he is. Here's my man uh, in here the he is. This I is Kristen's horse. Shorty Harmon. <laughs> Which is Shorty Harmon, <laughs> aka Regal Justice. So when you look at him, the first thing that you'll notice is that he is following his name. It says I N, and that means that he was bred in Indiana. They use the regular state codes here. Um, sometimes we have horses that are bred overseas, so they'll have uh, national codes, nationality codes. So it'll say F R for France or G B for Great Britain. Um, IRE for Ireland, for example. Or we also have a horse that was bred in Korea this year in the makeover, so it says KOR. Um, so then under here, you'll see he's a thoroughbred, and that's in there because they also have racing quarter horses in this database. But so this Regal Justice is a thoroughbred. He's dark bay. He was a horse, an intact male horse at the time of this filing. Uh, his birthday, he was foaled on the 15th of January. Uh, underneath that, you see the sire, 
the dam, and then the dam sire. They follow dam sires for breeding. It's an important part of the horse thoroughbred breeding world, the horse breeding world. So he gets notice on this page too. And then you can see as of the last start, he was uh, owned and trained by Julie Rodriguez and his jockey was Diego Rodriguez. You see his breeder. This is something that we include. Breeding information is something that we include in uh, our uh, RRP registrations. So you'll see that he was bred at Justice Farm by Greg Justice. Is how he got his name. All of Justice Farms horses are something Justice. So, ah, that, how nice. Yep, I got to explain that to my husband, who thought he was named after the judicial system. Since my husband <laughs> is a prosecutor, he was very excited about that. So I was like, what sorry, that's not what that means. So <laughs> he was bummed. Yeah. So uh, let's see, and then we'll see over here. We have the the statistics. So uh, Shorty started twelve times. He came in first twice, seconds and thirds, and his total career earnings $39,392. These are also details that we like to include in the uh, makeover horse registrations. Then you can see that when you when you scroll down, um, oh, you'll also see that he went to auction at least once. So when you look here, this will tell you that the horse was in an auction um, and it looks like he sold. So we'll go look at that auction history here in a sec. And actually, if you scroll back up to um, Equibase notes specifically horses that went through the Keeneland sale, that's what that little green ah. horse with grad, um, that's specifically a horse that went through the Keeneland sale, um, which is one of the bigger sales or um, bigger sales houses rather. So all Keeneland grads, and you'll actually notice that on a lot of racing forms as well. Yeah. We'll indicate that with that little icon. Yep. Okay. So Statistics, you can see that he's he earned all most of his money in his first year of racing, second year of racing less. Um, that's pretty typical. And when you look up like the like the iron horses, the horses that ran till they were 10, 11 years old, and they've got like nine years worth of winnings, it's very impressive. Um, and then when you click on results, you can see that these uh, all the all the races that he was in and how he did. So you can see his last <laughs> great. race was Indiana Grand. He raced on October 14th, 2017. It was race five of that day. It was a claimer. He uh, finished 10th with <laughs> speed number of 33. Uh, and uh, you can also look at the chart for all these races, the North American races, they usually have charts and videos for. Um, and so that's kind of cool. We'll get into the charts a little later tonight in the second half. Um, and then the video, I believe you need an Equibase account. Is that correct? That's right. You need an account yeah. to, to log into the video. Um, but you can scroll down and you can see, oh, he went in it. He ran out of stakes. He did as a juvenile. He'll yeah. sale black type stakes, which is a level of stakes racing. And it's called black type because it appears in black type in the form. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so he came in sixth. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, we'd have, we could open up the chart and figure out how many horses were in the field, which we don't necessarily have to do tonight, because um, I'm not sure he might have been sixth of six, or six he could have been six of twelve. Let's see real you know, quick. Knows? What the heck? Might as well take a peek. See what it's you Because I have... No, he was six of seven. Hey, he beat someone. Way he beat go, somebody. So this is what you'll be looking at later. Here's a little sneak peek of what you have uh, coming. So, uh, so basically, th th that's the, uh, the, the history. And you'll find, um, you know, more or less information in there, depending upon how long the horse has run. The next tab over in this thing is auction history. And here you can see that he went through Keeneland, but he was an RNA. And that means reserve not attained. So that means that they had a reserve on him and he didn't make it, so he wasn't sold. So um, for our purposes, for RRP horses, when we're doing the registration, uh, we don't count those. We only count horses that have sold, um, not horses that have just been through a sale. Uh, so, we, so for Shorty, we would count this one. This sale, if you hover over it, you'll see that was the Indiana Fall Mixed Sale of 2015, where he sold for $3,500 and that was would be the one that we would include in his 
uh, makeover registration. Yeah, it's interesting that he still counts as a Keeneland graduate, even though he didn't sell. So I guess you're just going through the sale itself is just enough of that. Process. Yeah, that's enough for Keeneland. It's <laughs> not enough for RRP. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But don't worry, if you go through the makeover process, you're a makeover graduate, regardless. That's right. You, that's right. That's so. right. We're more like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're more like Keeneland that way. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, so that's what those are. That's the basic information: breeding, racing, uh, auction, and uh, race results. Which is a ton of information. That's what I love about thoroughbreds: is that you can find any thoroughbred at all that has been registered and it will show up on Equibase and you can learn a ton of stuff about his background. Yes. And I'm going to load up another horse. This is one of our makeover horses for this year. And I didn't like get permission, but I figure since they're entered, that's... So this is Can't Help Believing and I'm bringing him up specifically because he well for one thing you can see he's bred in Ireland so the from the IRE his sire was also an Irish bred and his dam was a UK bred horse um he earned a lot of money <laughs> The thing that I found interesting him, one of the things that you see over here is that he was, um, you, his racing class is, uh, he, he, he ran well. So he's a multiple graded stakes winner and that is um, highlighted over here. Then when you go into his results, you can look up and you can see, oh my goodness, yes. He won the Sky Classic stakes at Woodbine and he was second in the Nijinsky he was, he was second in the United Nations. He uh, ran in the Woodford. He won the cliffhanger at Monmouth. So you can, you know, when your horse has, has something um, special, it'll show up over here. Um, another thing that I'm going to show, uh, you can, oh, another thing that you can see here in his, I believe, is it this one? No, no, it's not this one, another guy. Anyway, so he was, um, I thought this was one of the, well, anyway, I'm gonna, so he, so he shows you how you can see steak stuff. I'm gonna pull up another one. I feel like we're getting a glimpse into what it's like when Sally goes into horse registration. And you're like, yeah, well, the cool stuff. So, <laughs> I know, here's a, a, a a, a horse that not only was he bred overseas, he um, he's a, a steeplechaser and he did a lot of racing, as you can see, he did a lot of racing in the UK and that's kind of cool. Um, unfortunately, Equibase doesn't have the charts for that, those races, not till he got to the United States, but um, it's just kind of cool that it's in there and so you can see where when your horses run overseas where he's he's been and we also have for this horse auction like he was at Tattershall so you know he sold he sold in Ireland so that's well too yeah 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 this is a this was a, a cool guy so another horse another thing that'll show up in we have Imperative is a horse that of that's running in the makeover this year, who was a, a um, runner. So he is another multiple graded stakes winner, but he also has achievement. He has an achievements tab. It's just to have the tab is a big deal because yeah, just having that achievements tab. tab. <laughs> Breeders' Cup Classic participant. And he ranked 32nd and 11th in earnings. He had a top 100 ranking in earnings um, there. So that so that's like a lifetime achievement for for imperative. Um, but it's in interesting to note that while he was a you know a multiple graded stakes winner, high end three million dollar winner, you know he's got the achievements tab. But we have another horse that shows another way that you can be an achiever 
This is a great name. Yeah. Who named this word? Yeah, Champagne Chuck. I mean, is that an awesome name or what? And he won $225,000. He's got an achievements tab because he was 26th by wins. So huh. he had, I think, I want to say seven wins that year. Wow. And so he's an achiever. And I think when you go and look him up uh, in that tab, he's, you know, one of several horses that uh, was was uh, a seven a seven horse winner but in 2018 you know who was a six race winner justify so this champagne chuck won <laughs> justify good job chuck J good job for chuck so i'm i'm, I'm really i'm really uh high on chuck <laughs> and then there's one more thing that i found out that you can find here in uh that i find here in Oh, this threw us through for a loop in 2020. Because I remember yes. First so here we have John's Quest and John's Quest. There's another one, Quarter Horse. 1901. Probably not going to this year's makeover. Probably not going to be in the 20, you know, it's a mega makeover, but it's not that big. I wonder if they put in that 1901 because the Quarter Horse as a breed didn't exist then. So. I know, right? And when you look it up, it's like unknown parent. I don't know how he got in there. because it's all. Oh. Like, he must be in somebody's breeding record. It's kind of like an ancestry.com Article, yeah, know. even someone's pedigree. Uh, yeah. Tammy, who is preparing this horse for the makeover, says hello. She is oh. out with us on Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for letting us look at your horse, Tammy. He's very cool. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so he is. He looks like a, a like a perfectly fine um, makeover horse, but you'll see up here it says TB stats, and. So like in all of 2018, I don't think I ever noticed this before. And I'll, I don't even know half of 2019, but then suddenly realized there's something else up here. It's called mixed stats. What does that mean? Oh, that means that the horse also ran in out west, they'll do mixed races where they have their, it's not limited to thoroughbreds. So he ran in three of those. And uh, so, and he earned seven hundred five dollars in those. So when I was like going through and putting in people's um, money, it like wasn't adding up right, and I didn't really know what was going on. And then I looked up here, and I was like, "What is this?" So they do do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's usually they race them against. Typically, it's quarter horses, and it'll be like a longer sprint. Well, longer for quarter horses. Yeah, they. I was looking at these races, and they're all like five furlongs. So. Yep. Yeah, and Tammy just commented. She's like, I did not even know that myself. So there yeah, you go, Tammy. Back so to your night. horse is uh, a but... special guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he's uh yeah, and that is common. Um, especially it seems to be common in Western Canada in particular that we've seen a number yeah. of horses do that. Yeah, I'd say that's I'd say that's right. So that's sort of oh, so the other thing that you can do, uh, let's try it with with this horse. So Another thing that happens with horses when we're testing their eligibility, we want to know, um, we have like a deadline, July 1st of uh, two years prior to the makeover. So for 2021, a horse has to have raced on or after July 1st, 2019 to be eligible. And some, but there are also horses who are in race training who never make it to the track. So as long as the horse has what we call a published work, uh, that's when the horse is in training, he's training on the track, he's going out in the morning, he's doing his breezes or whatever, and that, all, that re information gets reported to the jockey club as well, or to Equibase. And so, you, um, so that information is recorded here. When, if a horse has been racing within the last 60 days, it'll be a tab, there'll be a workout tab here. So if you look up a horse that's currently running, it'll have a workout tab. Um, that ages off after about 60 days and the whole history of workouts after about two years, they, it's supposed to be after two years, but it seems to be, I've looked up horses where it should have been like, it should have been there and it's not. So maybe 18 months, I don't know how they do it. I'd like to actually talk to these people to find out what their, their words are. But uh, a way to find that is you go up here where it says results. And what we wanna see is workouts. And you just hit enter. Oh, and it's that easy. You oh, just... and he doesn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we picked a, oh, we gotta well, find. Well, it doesn't, but if I put in, let me see. 
and no one who has them ah is uh the one we were looking at before can't uh oh now, then you'll be me and you'll type this in the wrong place so we're going to go back up to can't help believing here and do work out this is way easier than the way i've been doing it wow <laughs> yeah so the other way you can do it the other way you can do it is to go to a horse that you know has workouts and then copy and paste the um the number but it's easier just to type workouts up there yeah that's way easier yeah do it this way uh, don't do it my weird way this is much <laughs> i'm telling everybody don't do it my day way do it this way this is much faster so he's been working out a lot at fair hill recently and and they're all there and it, it looks like it's for two years now um so that's all the kind of stuff that we get from Equibase and really everything that we put into the registration for the horses for the makeover is coming from Equibase. So, um, but sometimes, sometimes this workout history, you can imagine a horse may have, may have uh, raced within the time, uh, within the eligible time, maybe he, had workouts in July or August. And then by the time the horse gets into the makeover and then gets his registration in two years have passed. And so this information is no longer there. So when we do that, that's when we go to equine line. So equine line is a database that is uh, primarily for breeding. And um, it has much of the same information that um, is in Equibase, but it, it displays it differently. The other thing that we use this for is for horses that are in the sport tracker, and we want to we want to include a link to their five generation pedigree. Here you can get free five generation pedigrees, <laughs> so you can put in, for example, um, Regal Justice. Oh, and there was even another one. <laughs> yeah, let's see. This is why equine line is. This is why I prefer when people use equine line to look this up rather than like all breed pedigree query, which is yeah, like media of pedigrees. This is verified for sure by John verified for sure. Okay, so this is and you'll note that for Regal Justice, it does include that he was started twelve times, that he's a winner. Um, it has his breeding information. It has a lot of information here that shows that like. Nicking, which maybe they'll talk about later. I don't know um, if anybody's going to talk about that. I don't really understand what that means, but you'll see things like mares by the same stallion when bred to this same, his sire, um, the same damn sire bred to the sire. It happened twice, both started and they both won at least once. So, yeah, so that's why this is valuable information for breeders, you know, right? This is stuff that will refer back to that horse, especially when it's going through a sale, you know, to say like, look at what this other similar combination did. Exactly. That's why it's also important that they know that he's a winner in 12 starts and everything right on the pedigree, so. Right. Now, but, and one thing that they do have, because it's of interest to breeders, is if your horse uh, is, they will show, we'll show it here. They have this PDF lifetime starts past performance format. So that is a PDF that will show everything, all the horses, workouts, recent workouts and uh, uh, starts racing, his whole racing history in a PDF. It costs $8 and it's really useful. So when we have those horses who don't have any racing history in, e in Equibase, we'll come to Equine Line and we'll, we'll purchase this product for that horse and we'll, um, to verify his racing record. So it's got to be in one of those two places for that horse to be um, to be eligible um, for for the makeover because those are our these are our, our basic um, you know databases of interest. So that's what we do with equine line. It's in the sport tracker and it's and it's what we use to verify. Uh, unraced horses whose workouts don't show in Equibase. Um, 
And it's all like, well, I don't want to say it's public domain, but it's all like, it's all there. It's all free to access this stuff on the internet. So, you know, if, if you've not done this yet for your own horse, like take the dive into Equibase and Equine Line because there's so much cool information. And there is, everybody. there's really cool things. And you can go back, like, if you want to check the Sire's line, I've done this before, you can go click like on each one that's active and you can click all the way back and see which one of the foundation stallions your horse's sire line came from, which is kind of fun to do. You know, although I think they're like all the Godolphin Arabian anymore, but <laughs> it's still cool. <laughs> I love those things. You ever seen one of those big wheel things that they, the chart of North American blood? I get sucked into those for hours. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. We could talk about this forever, clearly. Yes, but. we can. And I, I don't want to take up too much time because <laughs> I do need to talk about the Jockey Club registry. It's also important because for makeover trainers, this is where you're going to go. If you don't, if your horse is not um, microchipped, this is where you're going to go to get a microchip. And this is also where you go to get a tip number. So, which we highly recommend that everybody. Now, in order to do this, you need to have, you need to create a free account. So I've already created my own personal free account. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, they want your address and they want to know what you want to use the database for. So they'll be like breeding, owning, racing, training, but it also includes tattoo research and the ever popular other. So those are the ones that I clicked because that's what I'm going to do with this. Um, so we're going to log in. And when you log in, this is the, this is the, uh, the basic uh, menu that you see. And you'll see all these things that are here for breeders and all these things that are pretty much here for owners. And then over here on the other forms is where we are going to uh, see the things that interest us. So um, here, this is where you would, um, like an, an owner might use some of these forms. Soldiers retired from racing, that's like a, it would be great if that were like an interactive form that you could go in and fill out, but it's actually a kind of complicated form that is, it's just like a PDF that you can print out. Um, so I'm not going to talk about that. But the first thing that you might want to do with your horse, if you want to keep track of its accomplishments post racing, is apply for a tip number. It's very easy. You just scroll down here to where it says apply for a tip number <laughs> and uh, here's where you go to do that. So I can log in. Do you want me to do this, uh, Kristen? Yeah, go for it. Time? This is the same login that we just used to get into the Jockey Club, right? So once you're yes. in, you're in. Yeah, good yes. deal. Yes. Yeah, go for it. So, yeah, because we quick. want everyone to get a tip number. Like it is the basically like the, the next logical step for you on the road to the makeover and then also after the makeover because it's very helpful for the jockey club to know where horses are going after racing um and it's just it's a nice way to keep track of your horse's accomplishments and like be rewarded for horse showing it and then also for trail riding they have a recreational riding program as well um that's awesome so yeah. what we decided we would do is since i don't have a tip number for my horse we're going to get a tip number for my horse uh, even though he's technically retired, um, they won't mind. So I'm going to go ahead. You can, you, they, they make it pretty easy to find your horse, depending upon what you may or may not know about him. So I'm going to put in his jockey club registered name, which is Cerulean Moon. And then they're going to come up and they're going to say, and I say, uh, Cerulean Moon, Malibu Moon, Through the Night, 2002, that's him. Carefully read these instructions. We've already read them. We're good. Yeah, carefully. yeah, read them before. You guys do it. You guys carefully read them. Otherwise, yes, you carefully read them. Oh, then I have to do because I don't have it. I'm not in there. Yep. So you can. Yeah, you just put yourself in. I have to put myself in. And then. If I was going to have a different name, show name, I would do that. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, do, 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 do. So, uh, 
and it's all the same. So I'm just going to submit it, right? Or do I have to retype? I that? think you can. No, I think you have to put yourself in again as the owner. Um, do I? Even though it is the same. But that way, then, like, if you, like, let's say you had a horse and you were leasing it to someone, um, then they can just register themselves as a rider in TI. Oh, nice. But then oh, they don't have to name. list the horse all over it's again. It's going to be Cerulean yeah. Moon. I like his name. That is a cool name. It didn't like it. No, oh, it didn't. I wonder why. Oh, well. You better be, we're chatting and didn't notice and hit the clear button, which is also possible. Oh, that's also possible. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, this is supposed, this is supposed to be like live interactive TV and supposed to be really exciting. When they do that on live interactive TV, they're clearly not doing it for real. There, uh -huh. there went. So that was it. It was that easy. And it was we that easy. Oh, and now I have it. It can still go. <laughs> So now, you know, Sally, now if you take them out on a trail ride, you can go ahead and log those hours in the recreational program or, you know, even, I know we semi-retired, but even if you do an in-hand show, you can register those. That's true. Ready. When we start so. doing our uh, Liberty work. Yeah. There we go. And look at what a cool number I got. Three. Oh, you did get a cool number. Look at that. One, 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 three. That's like a really cool number. Easy to remember if you needed to ever. But yeah, yeah I mean, it's super easy at the end of the show season. I just log in and put in all my show results. And then, you know, every couple months I try to add up my trail riding hours and submit those. So it's a really nice way to give that information back to the jockey club to say, these horses have retired from racing. This is what they're up to. Um, and just- It looks like if I were to lease him out to someone and they wanted to add in things, I would just have to add a rider. Yep. Yeah, very convenient. So you don't have to try to duplicate, you know, and register him again, because he's already registered. So you just add another rider and go. So that's awesome. the next program. And I now have a writer and owner ID. Ooh, there you go. All right. So the other thing, though, that I wanted to show people, again, going back to the whole um, research thing, is. Um, and I know if anyone too is um, asking, has any questions about registering a microchip, I don't know if that's what you're about to show us or not. Yes, that is what I'm about oh, okay. to show. I was gonna say we have some old videos on our YouTube as well on like a screen record on how easy it is to uh, register a microchip. Yes, so here, so the next thing we get, we're gonna look at is microchips and then we'll do a little bit on tattoos just cause it's so cool. So microchips, you you go back to the same i'm sorry i'm i'm going really fast you you go back to that same menu that we were at before with those kind of brown looking uh other forms and you'll see underneath there's research a tattoo and microchip lookup requests and reporting so this is where you go to the first thing you do to re is to report a microchip number for your horse so you put in your horse's name year of birth, dam's name. And I know that as you go through this, um, they'll then ask you for the microchip number. Um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go through all that. Uh, it's very easy. It just walks you right through it. If you need to acquire a microchip, you can get them from the Retired Resource Project, but you can also order them from the Jockey Club. So if you, you just say you want two microchips, click there, it'll verify your, your uh, address and it'll, they'll send them to you and then you, you pay for them online and they'll send them to you. So it's very easy. Also, if you want to, uh, if you have a horse, say you get a horse from an auction or a, 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 you find them at a place and, and no one really knows anything about him, um, you, can have if he if you if he looks like he's younger than 2017, you can have a vet wand him and enter his number here, and and that'll work. In fact, I had a number that I was gonna I was gonna show. Oh shoot. Anyway. Oh, okay. So if you have it the other way around. Yeah, you can go both ways. So like if you, so like, 
So like if, if I purchase There's a horse a that we know track that already has a microchip and the owner is like, here's his number, then I can just put the number in and then transfer the ownership that way. Yes. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. You don't have any two fields. So anyway, yeah, I can't find it. You have his, he needs a year of birth or damn name plus the name. Yeah. See. To double verify. So yeah. here you can look it up and it's like, oh, here he is. There's his dam's name, his year of birth. His name is Cobble. This is another one of our 2021 horses. And uh, so this is the, and you can verify, yeah, he's a bay, yeah, he's a gelding. Then you can look for another one. Um, and now that I know that he's 2016, <laughs> I can go back. Oh, I see what you're doing, okay. <laughs> and I can say that he's, if I know the horse, and I know his year of birth, or I know his mother, I can go through here, just click there, and, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong freaking field. If I did it in the wrong, that's what you do when you're entering your horse. But um, anyway. Yeah, I know we have a couple of videos to walk everybody through the process, like once they have the horse and they have the microchip and they need to report it. Yes, so, so that's what you would do here. You would that. do that, you would do the 2016. But the launch point for all of that is the Jockey Club interactive registration. So that should be everyone's first step. Yes. They haven't done it And yet. this is where you would enter the microchip number, enter it again, enter the date that it was implanted. Right? Yep, very simple. That's how you would do that. So that's what I meant to do. Um, and the last thing that is cool on the Jockey Club registry page is researching a tattoo. And I assume that this is gonna become less necessary as the years go by, but for the horses that are, um, that are, uh, if you have your horse's tattoo already, um, you can do, you can just enter that and you can search for it and you can see the other Cerulean Moon, 2002, through the night, that's him. That's how, if you get a horse's tattoo, but the cool thing is if you go back, you can also, if you can only like some of those tattoos get kind of grody over the years. So if you know that he's like a 2016 horse and you're looking at, the front and it's kind of round, so it's probably a zero because this only goes up to five. No, it doesn't include eight. Okay. And six, so a zero. And the second digit, you can't really see third digit, fourth, but the last one, you can kind of see it's probably a one or a seven. So we're just going to guess it's a seven. And then you know that your horse is a dark bay, you know he's a gelding. And oh yeah, he's got white marks. White marks on its head? Yes, he's got a star and a stripe. White markings on his legs? I happen to know my horse has them on his left legs. And then you search. And what comes up is like horses that- Whoa. <laughs> Very detailed very detailed descriptions of your horse. So you can go through and um, find the closest one to your own. And find the closest one to mine. <laughs> now, mine isn't in there because I think- I think you I, selected he was a 2016. I, yeah, I selected 2016 by mistake. He's 2002. So the, yeah, there he is. There's his irregular, irregular diagonal star pointed to the right, blah, blah, blah. And so it's really cool that they have this really detailed information about what your horse looks like that's entered in there to sort of as a verification for your, the tattoos and, and so to keep that from, you know, to keep everything honest. So it's, uh, so you don't, you, you, it's actually possible to find a horse in here with less information than you might than you might realize for older horses. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, 
man, I could get sucked into just playing with that for a long time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) You know, you can go through and and find your horse's tattoo number with the, if a horse's tattoo number, if you know enough information about it. So that's the basic things that we do. Um, And that's all the free stuff. (laughs) That's all the free stuff that you can do. Plus one little extra thing that you can pay for if you want. Um, on equine line. But that's all the free things that are out there about your horse and that we use in RRP to verify that the horses that we are registering, entering into our database and entering the sales ads for are actually thoroughbreds and are actually, um, you know. The horses that we say they are, yeah. That, that, they're, that they're doing. So that's, I, I, that's, that's, that's what's that's all the stuff that's out there and that's That's what again that's what I love about the thoroughbreds is that all this information you can really piece together quite a lot about your horse's past through all this and it's just it's neat to have that direct connection to a whole different industry you know most of us are riding them recreationally or you know we show them and compete but you know they had a whole past another life (laughs) yeah (laughs) well thanks very much Sally um, if anybody has any questions, definitely drop them in the chat or the Q&A um, or drop them in the comments on Facebook. Um, and uh, again, if you're watching this later, not live, uh, we'll do our best to get to any questions that you guys have too after the fact. Uh, but otherwise, I think we will bring Move in on. our next half of our panelists um, and we'll get into the, um, the meaty part, I guess. <laughs> so... There we go. Our panelists are coming online. Hello, everyone. So I will jump in again, um, and I'm going to introduce everybody. So you guys all unmute yourselves so you can all wave and say hello. Um, So joining us for the second half, um, we have another member of RRP staff that you guys probably don't get to see very often, um, Julia Otten. Hello, Julia. Wave and say Hello. hello. Do it again, and we'll jump to you. Here, I'll make it. There. Hello. There is Julia. So Julia is our program developer. Um, so basically Julia makes possible every single thing that we do as the RRP. So everybody say thank you to Julia. Uh, and Julia, uh, prior to working for the RRP, uh, was a, um, you were an exercise rider as well as a trainer. So Julia has got a ton of experience in the racing industry. Um, so we're going to pick her brain a lot tonight. Um, we also have Aubrey Graham joining us. Say hello, Aubrey. It won't, it won't pick you up if you just wave, you gotta say something. Damn, hello. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Uh, so um, so Aubrey is a makeover veteran trainer. Um, she runs AP Graham Eventing and Kivu Sport Horses in uh, Georgia, just south of Atlanta. Um, so she's joining us because uh, she sort of volunteered slash was asked. Uh, <laughs> but uh, she spends a lot of time um, like looking at her horse's histories um, you know, and she's got a ton of experience with thoroughbreds, so we thought we would pick her brain as well um, about looking into the horse's past. And we also have with us tonight, Caitlin Bradley. Um, Caitlin is a makeover veteran trainer as well. Um, and a lot of you Western guys probably know her as the mastermind behind the Western thoroughbred. Um, so that is the basically the chronicle of horses in Western sports. So she maintains a database and then uh, features horses and shares history of thoroughbreds and Western sports. Um, so she also spends a lot of time on Equibase and Equine Line. So uh, looking forward to some interesting discussion tonight and taking a look at um, what else we can glean from our horse's public records. So um, I'm gonna do some screen sharing. We've got some other stuff we're gonna look at. Um, I think we're gonna jump right into looking at horses race records. So let me get this set up. Um, there we go. And I think we're going to look at Aubrey's horses first. Ruh, ruh. See, oh yeah, they're in trouble. Oh, no, we don't need to look at Shorty. I'm going to skip him. All right. So we're going to take a look at uh, race records and what you can learn from them as it might relate to a horse's second career. Um, so we grabbed Pulpituity, who Aubrey calls Juice. Was this your 2018 horse? He's my 2019. 2019. Okay. Yeah. Good old juice. Okay. I remember he's a big, handsome chestnut. So, um, and there was, I know there was a reason that you wanted us to look at him in particular. So his record, he had one start earnings of $250. He's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Clearly lighting it up on the track. Oh, he was ninth. Oh, with a rating of 15. Yes. What a guy. So, okay, so let's say you're looking at this horse um, just as a prospect. So what do you think about when you look at this? So actually I had you guys pull him up because he's an interesting one because I actually spent a lot of time on Equibase trying to decide in between the time I committed to buying him and the end of the PPE, whether or not I actually wanted this horse. So I was relatively new to purchasing these guys straight off the track. I had purchased my 2018 horse, um, was looking for a 2019 horse, had had a handful through and was like, okay, this is great. Let's look at the records. And I went, all right, he only ran once. He made 250 bucks. He clearly sucked on the track. I mean, his speed figure of 15 is terrible. Um, so as you get used to looking at these, right, you get used to like, if you just see a 15 there, it doesn't mean anything until you see horses with a speed figure of 75 coming in second, you're like, oh, fascinating, you know, okay, 15's bad. So with him, I actually kind of did the full extent of what's available here. His workout tab, when I was actually looking at buying him was right on the screen. Um, so I looked at his workouts and he had quite a few workouts. He was a three-year-old when I purchased him. He had run that one race, uh, right? So you're gonna have to go, I don't know if you're gonna be able to find him at this point, and thank you, Sally, because now I learned how to go look them up again, because I was like, I know I had them, right. and now I know I don't. So yeah, this, this is very really fast bad. way. I'm going to look and see. You keep going. I'm just going to look yeah. and see if I can figure it out the other way. So I actually, I bought his video. I bought, uh, I did a 24-hour account with Equibase, and I watched his video. He broke well. He got, he made it up to third or fourth. And he made it around the first turn through almost through the second turn. And then he dropped to the very back of the pack. Um, he came in lengths and lengths and lengths behind everybody. And now at that point, I didn't know enough. I've learned so much in the past couple of years. Um, I didn't know enough to really raise enough of an eyebrow with that. But I checked his workouts and he did have three months off after that race. And then he came back to working out and he never quite made it back to the track. So what this tells you is from Equibase, I had a whole bunch of questions to ask because I realized I didn't have answers. I didn't know why he never ran again. So I asked and they said, oh, well, he's more of a, you know, they called him a morning glory horse. Um, he only runs the morning and he doesn't run, doesn't want to run in the afternoon. So, you know, and he just wasn't fast enough. He's big and he's gangly. Um, and there were a lot of things with that that were true. He's, he was huge. He was 17 hands when I bought him as a three-year-old. Um, and that links back around kind of awkwardly to the fact that he's a pulpit, you know, so going into the Equa line, which you can link to through Equibase, you can actually get right to their um, pedigree there. He's Corinthian and then pulpit. And Corinthian is known for throwing really big, lanky horses. And as far as I've heard through the grapevine, the fun part of this is how subjective all this gets is that I have heard that pulpits are relatively slow to mature. Um, now, who knows if that's actually has any, bears any weight with anything or carries any water and uh, it fits for juice. So you run with it. It's kind of like horoscopes some of the time. You're like, I hear that this horse does this. And you're like, wow, that's so true. Um, so that would drive if he didn't start and he's, uh, let's see, his start was I think in September as a three-year-old, his first start. So that, right. that kind of jives, you know, if he's a little slower to mature and a little slower to get going, then. And he's huge. I mean, he was so big that that all made sense. So a hair and full of these things made sense as to why do we have a late start? We have a huge horse. Um, why do we only have one start in the workouts? That's where I started raising questions. And when I vetted him, he had one thick ankle, um, which we x-rayed because I was like, I want to make sure that it's good because um, clearly something wasn't quite right. And so all these questions and we x-rayed it and the x-ray was, you know, some arthritis, but pretty good. Um, and it turns out when I finally ultrasounded that ankle that we had a really serious suspensory injury. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you watch the race, you can almost see it happen, um, where he's hitting the point where he's actually trying really hard and then there's nothing left and he just stops basically. Um, he didn't get a, did not finish, which is another fun thing to look up on here. If you get a DNF, um, like his one race, you know, he practically didn't finish, but, um, I actually just had a client buy a horse that had a DNF on there and it was explained really quickly by the people selling the horse. Um, yeah, you're going to see the DNF. The horse didn't fall. There was no injury. He just didn't break from the gate. So, oh, never the gate. so yeah, 
So it raises, you know, what I use Equibase for is trying to ask the right questions of the people you can contact through the horse's history. And so all of that is there. Um, so if you have a DNF, you ask that if you have a really slow horse who only runs once, you want to know why. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you have the horses that slow down in their racing, or it looks like there's an injury or a big gap in the race record, or if they bounce around a lot and are sold to different people, to different people, to different people, you start to ask kind of what's going on and what tracks run how and things like that. So again, I just use it to kind of raise the questions that I want answers to, and then see if I can track down those questions while trying to decide if this is a horse I want to encourage a client to buy, um, or just so I can ask the right questions and find out information when I'm trying to sell the horse for somebody else or keep it as a personal horse. Right. This might be the least helpful and illustrative comment in the footnotes for this race. Pulpituity had only brief speed. <laughs> that really yeah. doesn't give you a whole lot to go off of, you know, and, right. and you know, from based on what you can see from watching the race, you know, that clearly was a little more valuable than just reading the footnotes. Sometimes the footnotes are very helpful, um, but they do tend to highlight the horses that place higher <laughs> rather than the ones, you know, I mean, what else really is there to say about that race, I guess, for him. So um, I will pull up, um, my horse Jobber had a DNF, so I'll pull him up and then we'll hop back to your other horse reflection. Um, because yes, I, DNF is one of those things you see it on the record and you're like, ooh, that seems a little suspicious because there's lots of reasons that could happen. Um, for Jobber, it was actually, it does not seem like it was terribly serious. And certainly for what I have him doing, it's nothing that would raise any red flags to me. Um, but uh, let's see, Jobber Bill in touch, chased late turn, tired along rail, finished the race and walked off. He just got tired. It was just too much. He was like, I'm, I'm done and, you know, eased up. And so fortunately it didn't seem, he was back at it. I think a month later he made his next start. So it didn't seem to, I mean, he was 10th. So maybe it did slow him down a little, but then, you know, he was back to his normal form. <laughs> he was second a lot. So, um, so a DNF, I mean, certainly I think those are things you could look at. I mean, you know, if the horse was vanned off, that would definitely be something to ask about. Um, Julia, do you have any experience looking at any of those? I mean, well, sometimes if a horse is fanned off, obviously it's not good, but it can be a matter of things. You know, if a horse grabbed itself, grabbed a quarter really badly, you might put it on the van and, and send it off mm -hmm. just because you don't want their, their blood pressure is really high from running. You don't want them bleeding excessively. Right. If, if you van a horse off, it's not going to be plain the next start. So good point. You know, if you put a horse on the van, then you've got a free shot the next time you run it back. Um, but you're going to have to breeze the horse for the vet several times. So a lot of hoops, but uh, a horse could bleed and you might van it off. There, there are a lot of reasons. Um, and sometimes if a horse is pulled up, it can be not that bad. They might, the tack might slip really badly. And sometimes that ends up on the trouble line, saddle slip, sometimes not. So it doesn't always have to be a really bad thing. Just something you know definitely if, if you notice it is probably worth looking into oh i would definitely um yes yeah would, read the read the race report and, and just see yeah. see what there is to learn so all right let's hop back and take a look at aubrey's other horse reflection this is the right one the flatter there were several reflections in equibase so i made an educated guess that it was the 2014. yes all so right. um we call reflection fletcher he just it I don't like the name reflection. That's just me. So all these horses show, I compete them all under their uh, jockey club names, but they at home, they all end up with their own funny names. And sorry, my cat is yowling out of reach. So ignore her. Um, so uh, Fletcher's great. He, but he showed up here and we knew at some point, so he actually belongs to my friend and also a retired racehorse trainer, um, Erica Brown. And she picked him up for free from a Craigslist ad. And he was just sitting in a field. She goes, hey, look, I found this horse down here. He's not far from me. I think I'm going to go pick him up. Do you want to like help me try to sell him? I was like, cool. Yeah. We looked up his, um, and again, you, so you go to the top of that and you're like, he's, you know, he's by Flatter. And Flatter's known for, you know, again, hearsay in all of this, but I've heard nothing but good things in terms of their movement, their temperament their amateur friendliness, their shoulders. They are super athletes that just are lovely. Um, and I, you know, one of the ways I've learned a lot about 
the bloodline stuff is looking at what Jessica Redman posts um, and using her as an educational resource in terms of, I'm an inventor, I look for event horses, a lot of what comes through there, she's not, certainly not limited to that. But there's a lot of education that she puts out there with the posts and the pedigrees. So, and I know a bunch of people who have flatter horses, so I was like, great, touch of gold, um, it's a notable name, all right, let's take a look at this horse. Well, we got him and we found out once Erica had him that he had knee surgery at some point. And when he got to my place, I was like, hey, what's this lump? And we're like, uh. so I asked my vet and he's like, oh, he's got screws. So again, learning lots of things. He's got some hardware. And if you look at his race record in comparison to the horse and it's like, okay, so we have a space of four months and bone. Yep. Turfway and Delaware. Yeah, it yep. takes four months off there. And bone, B-O-N-E, four letters, four months, generally rule of thumb on these things. Um, he did have a some form of slab fracture to the knee. I'm not going to get the terms exactly correct, but we have x-rays and all sorts of fun data about his knee at this point. And someone bothered to put pins in it and fix it or screws in it, in which case he most likely ran again, right? So you're not going to assume that somebody's going to fix it at the end of his racing career, but then you'd look at workouts um, and you'd want to know what happened with the workouts. Did he keep running? Why was he retired? Um, so again, this kind of is just directing the questions, but with Fletcher and the information that we got from the rescue was that he did have the surgery and he went back to running and he was sound. So awesome. Now he's here and he's a sales horse, but I've got a sales horse with some pretty serious track jewelry. And so we've just kind of been, that's one of the interesting things with this is looking at some of these injuries that I know about after the fact, and then kind of tracking back to try to understand what happened and piecing together their past in a way to be able to learn when I look at something in the future and I see a four month gap. And then I might ask for some specific things when I'm doing a pre-purchase exam. I might ask, you know, are there any, you know, I might get x-rays if there is a lump. Um, some of the, you know, various fractures heal in certain ways. And it's not that big a deal a lot of the time. Um, I certainly don't encourage people to steer clear of horses with tractor really, A lot of them go, you know, to the upper levels and are fine. It just depends on what's where and what it is. So just knowing what's in there, what questions to ask, and kind of then to use the resources to apply the information to make sure you've got the most complete picture you can. Um, and right now, Fletcher's leased out to one of my students, and he's packing her around uh, Amoeba and Tadpole. Um, he went out and won his first event, his first three phase at Tadpole when I took him out last year. Um, and he's fabulous. So he's, he's sound and happy and that knee is absolutely holding up, but we are being somewhat careful with him. Um, but this allows us to kind of recognize where these things are happen, happening. Did they have the right amount of time? What was the expectation of that bone? Clearly if they put the screws in and then ran him a number of other races and he was, and he won one of those, he was running really well on it. Um, and then they just decide, you know, great in question of why they decide to retire him after that. But it becomes an interesting point knowing the injuries that you have and what the horse can still do on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. This is a really good example to look at too, because, you know, you can sort of theorize a little bit that with the levels that this horse was running at, you know, why they invested in Mm -hmm. the screw and then rehabbing him and returning him to the races. So Julia, you can probably help me speak to this a little bit. So maiden special weight. Um, and I also helpfully pulled up, if you guys are looking at these um, results and you're like, I don't know what any of this means, uh, we can, we'll go over it very, very quickly tonight. Uh, but on Equibase, there is a very helpful list of codes and definitions that will explain what all of this is. Um, so, you know, if you're just like a lay equestrian who's sort of stepping your foot into the racing world, um, you know, race types are really helpful when you're looking back. Um, so we'll pull up Fletcher again. Um, no, that's juice, there he is. So Fletcher was running maiden special weight. So that's anything that's a maiden, that's for a horse that's never won a race. Um, special weight, the weights are assigned by age. Once they get into maiden claiming, that's considered a drop down in class. Is that correct, Julia? Yeah, a maiden, a maiden special weight is an allowance maiden race. So the horses right. are not there to be claimed. And also um, those racetracks, Churchill, Keeneland, they're premier races. Right. So a horse that, um, that wins a maiden special weight there is a nice horse usually. Right. Now you yeah. might have a horse that's what we call, you know, maybe it's a bit of a well-bred flock 
So you might run that in a maiden special weight at a cheaper racetrack because you want to breed the horse because she's well bred and you don't want it claimed, but she can't run against those horses. Now, if you're running the horse to make money, obviously you want to run the horse where sh she's competitive or he's competitive. So um, you might not even start with a, a maiden special weight. You might start with the, like around here, claiming 10,000 or something, something simple. So the claiming price is very, um, tells a lot about the quality of the horse or the quality of the opposition that they're running against really. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that this horse then, you know, once he did break his maiden at Turfway, he was back to allowance for the next two starts, including on either side of that gap. So he was, I guess, clearly showing enough, you know, competitiveness at the allowance level at Turfway that they, you know, invested that time to bring him back. So, and then maybe it just didn't quite pan out for him after that. He was eighth and then had to go back to the claiming races to get that second win. Mm -hmm. um, and I would bet if we're the, like on the chart for results, it'll just tell you the level that it's at. It won't tell you the conditions, but I would hazard a guess that probably these are conditional claiming races. So that's when you get into like non-winners of two. So let's see, um, for three-year-olds and upwards, which have never won two races. So that's, yeah. So horses will start to work their way up or down those levels. So you might have a horse, and I know Julia, you were gonna to touch on this a little later, but you might have a horse that, you know, might get his first win against Maiden Company and is probably unlikely to ever win again against other horses who've won a race before. So you'll find like non-winners of two, non-winners of three, um, horses that have never won X or Y. Um, and then like this also has conditions, non-winners of race since July 2nd. So you know, you can kind of go back in time and, and work out where this horse will be the most competitive. So, and that is the race that he won. So he got his second win and then let's see what he did after that. So it would have been after this race, they decided to retire him. And that was for three-year-olds and upward, which have never won three. So it's possible that maybe they decided he wasn't gonna be competitive in this company or, you know, for whatever reason, he gave them enough indication that this was not going to be his jam. So, but um, I mean, some horses, they might win one against other maidens and just not ever be able to win another race again, but at least they have the win on their record. So mm -hmm. interesting. All right. Um, so that was a little bit on levels of racing, but allowance, it'll go allowance and then you'll find black type stakes and then you'll get into listed stakes and graded stakes are the highest level of competition. So if you have a horse that's one run in graded stakes, then he's made it really to the, the highest tiers. Um, now let's see. So between the three of you, between Julia, Aubrey and Caitlin, um, what do you guys like to look at? If you're looking at horses for second careers, what kind of surfaces do you like to see them running on or does that not matter? to you? Uh, oh, I think it makes a lot of difference. I mean, most turf horses have a, a more action and a big strong shoulder. You see more of your rangy horse on the turf, generally speaking. And uh, the one horse I liked, um, it showed it had run well on the sealed slop, which is an abbreviation. I'm, I'm just got to give our magazine a plug too, because <laughs> This actual issue of the magazine, it's quite an old one, but we can, it's still available in the store. And there's a really, really good article in it about reading form. And it's actually written by our own Jen Royce, um, but it goes through everything. So if you, if you go to the races or you're going to the races, it, it's a really nice little prep to read. I, I was looking at it the other day. It's really, really good. Um, but horses that run well on sealed slot, that's rather like riding on the beach when the tide's gone out, you know, a horse gets in a rhythm and clops along. A lot of those horses make, that's like your event horse. It's the same sound. It's the same feeling when you ride one in the morning when the track's sealed for the rain, that, that's the same feel as riding a good event horse, a horse that really gets in a rhythm and likes that. And um, horses that go long and come at the end of the race, a lot of times that's a calmer natured horse because he's getting in his rhythm and then he's boom, running the horses down. That kind of horse that might on, go on to be your nice event horse, as opposed to a horse that goes short on the front end. 
ping pong ball, you know, that's going to be a much sharper horse. Now, obviously, they come out of training, they change. But if you're just looking at, at a race, that kind of horse that gets in a rhythm and takes a pace, that would be my pick. If I was just, okay, here's a horse, pick it off the paper today, you're taking it home, for sure. Interesting. Aubrey, what do you think? In relation to that, any, you know, turf horses, I thinking of, and that's great. I mean, Julia's going to have much more information on this than I do. One of the things I just kind of as an aside that I do look at that I might be a weirdo about is the dosage profile. So one of the fun oh, things- we're going to circle back around to dosage. Oh, I'll get back to that later yeah, then. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you can school us off. Like, what is dosage? So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, do you have any particular surfaces or tracks or distances that you look at or you just sort of take take what catches your eye? I mean, anytime you hear that something is running turf, it's running longer, um, you start thinking, okay, it's got endurance and looking at, you know, the event side of things, which is what most, most, not all, I have some, you know, some of my clients and students are hunters, um, show jumpers and things like that. But when you're looking at a horse that needs to go cross country, if something's quite successful on the long, you know, the actual longer tracks and over grass and enjoys running on that, then it's like, okay, cool. They already have that. But again, a lot of that can be trained and you know more once you get, you know, have the horse in front of you. But yeah, just starting kind of down those lines, taking a look at that is helpful. Mm -hmm. Caitlin, are you still here? I think she's still on. Uh-oh, Caitlin, did we lose Caitlin? Still here, but I'm not sure that I have much to contribute to the eventing yeah. side, so. So Caitlin, coming from more of a Western background, are you, would you want to look more at a sprinter first, or again, is it going to be, you know, whatever appeals to you, maybe confirmationally first? I would say I definitely look at confirmation first, but since we're talking bloodlines, uh, anything sprint bred is where I tend to uh, be drawn to, and then Beyond that, uh, I really like to look at stallions and bloodlines that are also doing well in the quarter horse industry. So a lot of thoroughbreds are being crossed out to quarter horse, quarter horses, and um, you can use equine line and equibase both to find those lines that are doing well in both the quarter horse racing and the thoroughbred racing industries. And those horses seem to just do exceptional in Western events. So uh, lines like Hadif and Phone Trick and uh, Salt Lake, he's probably my favorite, but th those horses um, just, they seem to do really well. Good, I think we'll circle back around to bloodlines again, because I think we can all discuss that at length for a long time. But before we do that, I do want to make sure um, we're going to look at some charts. Um, Ooh, no, we're going to skip that. Okay, so um, we'll get back into the bloodlines, though, because I think that's what everyone really likes to talk about. <laughs> so um, Julie in particular wants, and this is where I'm really interested in, because I don't go to the races very frequently, and I, when I go to the races, I just go to hang out. I don't always necessarily go to um, look for horses for sale, but Julia wanted to take a look at this because there's some indications in here of, you know, when a horse might be ready to retire, or, you know, what moves a horse might be making next in his career. If you're keeping an eye on one for sport um, that might be ready to retire. So um, Julia very nicely went to the races for us and grabbed a racing form. So um, we have that scanned in. So this is the horse you wanted to look at. Start with yes. Well, I just, I just randomly picked this horse because there was a, a few things in there I thought might be interesting. First of all, this, race is actually what they call a beaten race which sounds a bit negative but a lot of the names of races is old you know it's old sport so they don't really think think positive but uh this is a race for horses claiming five thousand so that is the bottom uh and um they either hadn't won since september or never win four they, they usually put two conditions together so you get enough horses to make a pretty decent race um so you would think a horse that wins, you know, you want to keep him. But a lot of times a horse that wins a race like this will be looking for a second home. And I just sort of randomly picked that one horse. Um, he's not for sale right now because he actually, I mean, he's still in training. I just picked him because um, I thought his form was interesting because he's done so many different things. So when you say then like if a horse that wins this race, 
he would then go to a different class of races then, right? Because he well, would be eligible well, for a race like this, where yeah, he hasn't won. I think, well, he's won four now, mm -hmm. and he doesn't have this condition anymore. So where are you really going to run him? Now, he might run so well. Sometimes when a horse wins, they get a bout of confidence and they get a little better. But a lot of times when they've won this race, they're sort of out of conditions. You'll see a horse that's just out of condition. Because you figure anytime you win a race, you've got to assemble six horses that have just done the same thing as you and run them against each other. You know, it's like the maiden. So it's it's very exponential steep climb to win the next race sometimes. Sometimes horses will get good and just bounce them off. But I just thought this was horse was interesting. And there's a few points I sort of wanted to make. First of all, if you look at a horse that comes with a trainer like this, if you're looking at the, um, when you look at the trainer, it says how many starts they've had at that meet, 52 starts, 15 wins, nine seconds and eight thirds, right next to the trainer. So a 29% trainer like that, um, if you're getting a horse from someone like that, chances are that they have been very well taken care of because you, you're not successful if you don't take good care of them. And um, it's very unlikely you'll get a horse from that kind of an outfit that hasn't been regularly wormed and vaccinated and, and well, very well looked after. So I always think that's an interesting point. And people like that are very businesslike. They've always got more horses coming in. So it's never bad to make a connection with trainers that have a lot of horses at the races. I mean, I wouldn't bother them when they're in the last few minutes before and after a race. But if you, when you go and see who puts a saddle on a horse, that's usually either the trainer or the assistant. So it's nice to introduce a network. And sometimes they'll say, well, we'll see how he does. So, you know, you've made a connection and, and that's always a good thing. And um, this horse has run, if you look, uh, he ran, as I said, on that sloppy sealed track. If we're going along the top here, we look, it shows oh, all the dates of when they ran uh, and the fractions and sort of how he runs. He runs fairly near the top. And then you'll see little things here like this BLR. He ran in blinkers, front bandages and Lasix. And I wouldn't be put off by a horse that runs in bandages. I would think every single horse that they run goes over there with four blue vet wrap beautifully put on and they get taken off with a razor blade after the race because it's a claiming outfit and they don't, they don't like people to think, oh, we only run the ones with bandages that have a little bit of a problem. So they all go in bandages and then everyone can wonder, you know? Um, so that's an interesting thing, I think that's relevant to a horse in a second career. The reason I like this horse was they put the apprentice on him. Now, Maryland are uh, very, uh, it's a very big apprentice state. We've always liked apprentice riders. So a lot of very, very good riders have come out of Maryland historically. And if you think about it, why would you let somebody loose on your horse that's never won a race? Well, we're giving them some weight. So they're always affectionately known as bug boys because the, um, by their name, they have little stars that look like little bugs. And this kid is a triple bug. He still claims 10 pounds, which means he's won less than five races. Okay, um, so that's the 111 and 10. So he's carrying 10, 111 yeah. So pounds. this kid can't eat very much, no. Right. He's, getting, he's getting a 10 pound allowance, which the old theory was a pound off the back is a length. Um, which uh, there's the old joke, you, you give them a pound, you need a stone, that's 14 pounds. But, you know, sometimes what you're making up for in, um, what you're making up for in weight, you're winning in bravado. Now, the, it might be you're taking the weight off because the horse needs the weight off. You know, he's got a little problem or um, some of these older horses, it cheers them up to put a kid on them because they just cart those kids around with a smile on their face and it gives them confidence. Now, that kid is probably working very hard at the barn in the morning too, so you have to throw him a bone. If you look underneath, he's had 77 mounts to win three races. So he's obviously game as Dick Tracy, you know, he's probably ridden some quite bad horses. He's only won 4%. But I just thought that was an interesting point to make. They get uh, 10 pounds till they've won five races, and then they get seven, then they're a double bug for uh, until 
they've won 30 and then they get five for a year. And there's some, some states are different and they can have a stay of execution if they get hurt. But I always think that's interesting if someone's put a bug on a horse. There's, you know, there's a lot of reasons, but you would, usually wouldn't put a bug. You don't see anybody riding in the Kentucky Derby with a bug. I mean, you wouldn't right. put a bug on your favorite horse. So I thought that was interesting. And I also like the fact that this horse has run on the turf and on the dirt. You see these little symbols here for turf. I mean, honestly, you can look at symbols all day long. This horse has been claimed. Um, but I just thought there were some things about him that was interesting. He's by Bernardini. So if I went to the races, that would be the sort of horse I would be, I would be looking at, thinking that they might be looking for a home soon, even though he's a really good horse. He's made 141,000. But I just thought his form was interesting because it stood out with a lot of different things. He's run in the slop. And another thing that's always interesting is to look and see how many horses were in the race. You know, you're winning a four, four horse race is not quite the same as winning a 12 horse race. Um, and uh, see, this horse breezes really well, though, which means the has, bug boys, the bug boys a... probably been breezing him because yeah, apprentice riders always go too fast in the morning because they're. There's, you tell them go easy, but they're practicing and they're showing off to the girls. So they always end up going too fast. But um, I thought that was interesting that the horse has been, been breezing really well. So I just thought he was a nice form to pick out and just, just to take a look at. And, you know, some, the, the white here, that just means that's their post position. And as I say, you can spend a lot of time reading the form and it, it's not all relevant to horses as a second career, and it's certainly cheaper to learn to be a doctor than a gambler. But it, it's just nice to see little things that show you how the horse might be in their new life. And as I say, I wouldn't be put off the bandages. Um, and layoffs, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a very hard thing, as Aubrey was saying. If you're going to give a horse time, you probably need to stop soon enough give them off long enough and bring them back slow enough. And that often doesn't happen. So you lead to, um, to what I call the botch break, which doesn't maybe achieve what, uh, what it sets out to do. So it's always good to ask why a horse was off. And if a horse has been with multiple trainers, sometimes you, um, people never mind if you ask them about a horse, if, if you're thinking of giving it a good home, everybody is always wanting to help with that. I wouldn't ever be, um, be afraid to introduce yourself to people at the races. Yeah, this is interesting. So um, when does Laurel's meet, um, sorry, very loud car just went by. When does Laurel's meet run? Cause I noticed he's got a break. It's, some of these are from COVID. Okay. And in fact, they yeah. did an interesting thing here with this SOCN. No, this was when Hugh lost him, SOC. When they broke for COVID, if you ran the horse back for the same money when they stopped racing for COVID, if you ran the horse back for the same claiming price as it was running before the break, then you got one shot where you could enter the horse not to be claimed. Because, you know, people didn't want to fill the races because they were saying, well, the horse isn't very fit. We've kept him ticking along. We didn't really know when we'd be able to run him. And I don't want to lose the horse if he's not 100%. So they said, well, that's fine. You can run the horse one time and have it not to be claimed. And then he ran it back the next time and he couldn't do it because um, he'd had his one shot at not being claimed here and, and, and Jerry took the horse. So um, that was, that was a, an interesting thing they did. But some of those breaks, because they have actually had to stop a couple of times. But the other thing is too, sometimes horses get a break because your race doesn't go. You know, there's, there's, um, there's about 17 races every day to choose from to make nine. So eight of them don't always go. So sometimes a horse stays home for quite a long time because they just don't get in, which is frustrating, but it's one of those things. That's going to be interesting as, you know, like looking ahead, like maybe for the makeover class of 2022, like going back and looking at horses that are available. A lot of these horses are going to have like a pandemic break in their records. They are, it's yes. It's going to be really interesting to see, you know, like why did the horse take a break? Oh, well, he couldn't help it because racing was shut down for months, you know, so that's going to be actually really interesting to navigate going forward. So, so yeah, for all you guys looking for your next horses, keep that in mind. So, so what I did then um, was I pulled up um, the, whoops, not on that one. I pulled up the chart for that race. 
Mm, I think, yep, yeah, there's start with yes. So he finished third. Um, so, and then in the footnotes, I noticed start with yes, a bit rank at the break. But it was naughty. Yes, I laughed when I saw that. <laughs> um, and it was interesting because he obviously bothered the horse that was next to him too, because Mystic Times lunged. He probably lunged because the horse next to him was bunny hopping. You know, sometimes uh, it's like children, you get a domino effect. If one horse is naughty in the gate, the next horse starts to be naughty too, um, especially with younger horses. Yeah. Yeah, we've all been there in the schooling range. Yeah, I mean, it's the same. <laughs> yeah. right. okay. That's just, that's interesting information, maybe for his next owner to be like, well, you know, it might be something to look back and see if he's ranked at the break a lot. That might be something to keep in mind, that, you know, as you maybe bring him out on a fresh morning and see what happens. So lots of information that can be gleaned from these things. So, but then he did settle well, settled well back past the five eighths, quickly gained four wide from the three eighths of the quarter pole, bid between foes nearing inside the three sixteenths, gained a short lead past mid stretch, but failed to sustain. We get good charts in Maryland. We have them. Yes, yeah, say whoever writes these, someone's yeah, really uh, Bill. watching, watching well. Very good right chart writing. Nice. So yeah, so if anybody's going to the track to look for horses, definitely bring Julia with you, first of all. But then Oh, I'm always happy for an excuse to go to the racetrack. There's a limited amount of spectators allowed now, too. Yeah. But you know, maybe uh you can watch from home on your favorite betting network um too. So all right. Um so now we're gonna get back into the pedigrees because I am interested to talk to Aubrey about uh dosage and what that means because I've never really understood it and i would love to know how you look at that for a second career um do you have a horse off the top of your head um I, gosh we can pull any up you can pull up i have no idea what his dosage is going to be but you can look at don't knock it we'll look at my 2018 horse and yep so also comically one of my students knows how and i don't know how to do it but you can look up what name they were attempted to be entered in as and I can get the information from her where you get that and give it to you guys at a later date. <laughs> because we found out later that the name that he was attempted to be registered as was Knock It Off. And oh. this horse, is, I love him to death, but he is the most annoying horse on the face of the earth. And he apparently was the most annoying horse on the face of the earth since he was young. So it just made, cracked me up when I realized that's what they tried to name him. Um, okay. He says F for his true nicks. Which I don't, I, to be completely honest, I have not done the research on the nicking stats to know how to use those. Yeah. Uh, Are you more familiar with nicking? I know it's based on, it's based on how well I think historically certain lines have produced or performed interacting with other lines. Like when they say like, oh, that's a good nick. Like there's evidence that that combination has worked well in the past. Is yeah, and I, I guess I'm not um, as well, not versed well enough to explain it, but considering there is an A++ rating, I'm assuming an F is not the greatest. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think we can, yeah, we can assume that. <laughs> yeah, F isn't good, is Sorry, it? Sorry, Forrest. Um, yeah, Forrest is a twit across the board um, and was not a very good racehorse either. Um, so his dosage profile is pretty similar to a lot of them though. So when I look at things, I'll take a quick glance at this and what basically I understand dosage as massively in, in like the most layman terms out there. If you look it up, there is some extraordinary literature on what it means, where it comes from, what level sire gets what ranking in what, but basically the whole thing is based, sorry, my stupid cat, Zoe, shut up. Um, the whole thing is based on the uh, basically speed to stamina. So on your left, you're gonna have, um, it's brilliant, I believe. And I'm not gonna get my terms right, but basically your left-hand number of your five numbers, your four in this case, the first four is going to be your brilliant number. And then your far right number is gonna be professional. And what that means, basically you're going from sprinters who ran really fast and really well in the brilliant category to those that ran the much longer races and are, and not, so sires that were successful at those lengths um, and having that kind of speed profile. So the way that I then understand this is you're, if I see a horse that's going to be zero on the right 
four numbers and a 12 on the left number, my brain goes to a uh, barrel racer, po polo pony, like super fast. And I start thinking confirmation, possibly slightly more bullet like downhill. Um, maybe not though, they could just be really, really fast um, and very quick dig in speed. When you start going, I look at then looking at the middle number, a lot of my horses, the middle number is the highest. And that may just be how a lot of horses are bred for kind of the crapshoot of, well, this is these are the types of races run commonly. This is what the sires are getting. Um, and you'll have a much higher um, classic number in that case. But as you kind of move from the left at speed to the stamina on the right, um, so that his zero would be his stamina number um, based on this categorization of sires. Yeah, I start to think through kind of body types, career types, what the horses are looking like. And I've never not bought a horse or not sold a horse for someone based on the dosage. But it's really interesting when you start going, okay, this person is looking for this type of horse. I know the rider is this type of rider. They don't want something explosive. And with that real caddy explosive power, then I'm not really looking for something with a really high number on the front end. Exactly. And this doesn't ever exist in a vacuum um, at all, right? So when I look at this, I look at this in relation to the sires. I look at this in relation to their racing. I look at this in relation to the info I can find on them, their pictures, their jog video. Do they come out and jog sweetly and nicely on the line or are they jumping all over the place? I mean, it all, all of that comes together, raises questions, answers questions kind of, um, and you get a better picture of the horse. But again, I don't ever just look at that and go, yes, yes, this one. Um, whereas a lot of people will do that with pedigree, um, sometimes and just buy off of pedigree yeah. um, or buy off of dosage profile. So I'm curious now, Caitlin, can we look at monkey? You mind if I put him in? Sure. Go to the midget horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Caitlin's horse, the love monkey is a thorough pony and he is 14, three. And did he race mostly in sprinters? Um, oh, that's interesting. Mostly, uh, he he usually didn't run past like four furlongs. <laughs> I mean, he was in longer races, but. And we know for, based on, you know, his job now and based on the experiences you've had, he definitely can fire off the line pretty fast as a horse. Like I know his acceleration is maybe too good sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, so, and, and I don't know that, you know, I, I don't know why he's so small, because I know the the mayor he's out of, Sweet Machine, who's also produced some, like, 17 hand high horses, so not really sure why he's so, as tiny as he is. Little as he is so yeah. I think, I think confirmation might play in here more. Yeah. And although the, the green monkey was extremely fast, so. Yeah, so, okay, so. Aubrey, as someone who is better at looking at a dosage profile, what, imagine you do Again, late, like real basic, basic. Yeah, very basic, that's okay. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't see anything in this dosage profile that would put me off or anything that's going to go jump. Um, or, you know, you look at it and you're like, all right, is this, you know, if there's a, anything registering on the right hand side of those numbers where there are zeros you kind of go oh, maybe you're you know you're nice long cross country it might be built for that but I also think that a lot of horses can be trained and legged up to do that so I don't ever use this to knock horses out of the running but I would say this one is definitely more he's quicker on his feet in the shorter distances like in terms of what it's setting up to be mm -hmm. ah this cat's killing me <laughs> <laughs> again, again, this is just one of those tools that people can use when assessing a prospect, but like anything else, maybe won't be the, the be all end all, you know, exactly. kind of taking a horse home based on this, but it's interesting to look at, you know, and I bet it'd be interesting, you know, if <laughs> this sounds like a rainy day project, but it'd be interesting to look at, you know, other horses that we know are successful in certain disciplines and look back at their dosage and see if there's, you know, correlation there. So look at some of our really good barrel racing thoroughbreds that you know, fire very fast off the line and are agile enough to do those sharp turns and rollbacks and blast out of the barrel again versus, you know, your upper level cross country horses who are galloping long distances in a, a steady rhythm. So 
And also, also wondering about other countries and their racing as well, right? Because we do have trends in the way that American racing is run, how we've bred horses to race in this country. And I'm no expert in this, but it does raise interesting questions of do, do Irish race horses, Irish thoroughbreds being run in Ireland, are there, you know, for the various races they run there, is there a difference? Are they breeding towards um, a more, I don't know. I mean, this is just a, I could, I could put Korea in there or Japan in terms of the races as well and say the same, you know, ask the same questions, but is there, is there a set of um, kind of an ideal profile that people are trying to breed their sires towards um, mm -hmm. to produce the progeny that's going to run for the races that are offered in that space? Right. Yeah. Good questions. Um, so, and I would imagine, oh, it's interesting actually that monkey has no nicking great at all here. Um, the nicking, I think, really comes into play if you're looking at how well the horse is bred for racing. So I'd be curious if, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't look at that many horses, but I'd be curious if, you know, good nicks for the track have any kind of correlation to, you know, good sport horses. But again, I think a lot of that, like you were saying, comes down to conditioning and training. So just because a horse is bred to be a race winner doesn't necessarily mean it will be any better or worse in a second career than anything else. So um, I, I guess I will add to that very quickly and just say that my take on it is that good breeding is good breeding. And a lot of times the horses that do well in second careers have exceptional um, sires and dams as well. And you just see mm -hmm. that carry down in not only their confirmation, but also their character. Yeah, they're a well-bred horse. A well-bred horse just has a certain charisma that seems to transfer onto their second life. And yeah. if they do do well on the track, they do tend to have that. I don't know something extra that. Yeah. Well, and even a horse that was well-bred and then for whatever reason doesn't do well on the track, you know, but you can still see sort of that class about them. Yeah. So. Difference between Fletcher and Forrest. <laughs> <laughs> but we love Forrest anyway, it's fine. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so um, the nice thing too with Equibase is that it will highlight when a stallion uh, makes a repeat appearance in a pedigree. So you can see Mr. Prospector is highlighted in red, and Northern Dancer is highlighted in gold here on Monkey's pedigree. Um, do you guys worry much yourselves about inbreeding or line breeding or you know repeat names coming up? multiple times? I would say I don't necessarily. It depends on, but then again, it depends on the, the stallions that we're looking at. So, you know, a lot of people, Stormcat's always a fun one to bring up and is running, you know, forestry is amazing and I'm not surprised to hear that the green monkey is super fast. Um, I also know that forestries tend to make really wonderful sport horses, but you, then you get people who look at that and go, ah, Stormcat. And you see multiple Stormcats, in and for temperament and a number of things and quirkiness under saddle or mouthiness there's a lot of things that come up and you have people who split into camps around sires or love them right if you have malibu moon i know people that will buy anything that is by malibu moon because it is and like will almost ask none of the questions that often are asked just because they know the breeding of the horse um so when you get the inbreeding on a sire you really like that's you know that my answer questions for people as opposed to raising them and when you get like winchester place where i get um a handful of my thoroughbreds from and i love them to get to death they're wonderful they have a three-time stormcat mare and she's she throws very fast bowls but she is also known to be the three-time stormcat mare and that's what they call her when they refer to her in the field that she'll teach the other horses a lesson right so there's you when you look at the inbreeding along those lines it gets really interesting and Fletcher's is a, that's quite bright. That is a rainbow. Wow. I did not, you know, and I will say I did not pre-screen this horse. I just was like, well, we'll look at him because we've been looking at him anyway. But there is a lot of repeating and repeating yeah. mares too, which is interesting. Here's wild applause is in here. Yeah, that's not that, that's not nearly as calm. Yeah, that's pretty unusual actually. Yeah, to see. On that, that far left on the pedigree anyway, you'll see it a lot more on the right of the pedigree when the big studs are created but fascinating um they ran out of colors i think but if we look at his his mm -hmm. I, i'm like look at his dosage because again i have his dosage was not something i looked at we pulled him out of a craigslist field and you know he has 16 as his middle number being his 
um, classic speed. So again, everything's still weighted to the left, but much higher in that center. Um, so the center of distribution actually shifts a little bit, which is that other explanation of kind of how to read the numbers, which way everything's tipping. So a lot of names that, you know, you'll see a lot of, um, I don't want to say they're in every pedigree, but you do see a lot of Mr. Prospector. You see mm -hmm. a fair amount of AP Indy in just a lot of horses, just because they're, you know, those modern foundational stallions that are in a lot of pedigrees. Um, there's a lot of Stormcat and yeah, Stormcat for whatever reason has the reputation of like, oh, the Stormcats. But I, it's one of those things where there's so many representatives of stallions like that, that you're going to get the range of every single possible kind of horse within it you know, is my take on it. So like, yes, you will get a number of so-called storm cats that are spicy and difficult and tough to work with. But then because there's so many of them, you'll also get some very nice sweet ones that are easy as pie. So I think that's something to keep in mind too. Um, that, you know, <laughs> for yeah, these yeah, thousands of offspring and, you know, and thousands of descendants and especially ones who've gone on to be sires of sires, you know, are going to have a lot of descendants out there. So running the gamut so and the mayor's such a big factor too i mean the mayor actually raises the fold to a degree so a lot of temperament comes from the mayor and you don't have such a litmus test with that do you right yeah and then i've heard other arguments you know that it's um it's the mayor's bloodlines but it's also just you know how how the mayor herself is as a horse you know to for those first formative <laughs> six months or so you know to to raise the horse well so um yeah we've been asked multiple years why we do sire madness and not damn madness or broodmare madness and we just don't have the same representation in the thoroughbred sport tracker you know it's so much easier to when stallions are covering you know 100 or more mares a season it's a lot easier to have a, a bigger sample size by stallion than it is by broodmare so yeah, it's a little tougher to, to find that information. Um, but we have had it, we've had it in the past where multiple foals from the same dam are at the makeover in the same year. So that's really cool. So um, it would be interesting to look at more of those and do a little bit of a case study to see, you know, are they similar? Um, are they more similar than horses by the same sire? So interesting food for thought. Um, so the last thing I want to touch on, um, and I know we're running late, so, um, but one thing that people love to debate, like what are good sport horse bloodlines and how do you decide? Oh. And this is, this is what comes with the giant, this is very subjective disclaimer. But what do you guys like to see as a good sport horse bloodline and why? <laughs> Aubrey's eyes got very wide. <laughs> <laughs> it's so subjective. <laughs> A lot of people, I mean, I know a lot of people who look for AP Indy offspring because they often think they're athletic and they think they're a good temperament. I know people who will buy storm cats. I know people who look for deputy minister somewhere in there. I mean, just looking at this, there's so many. Uh, it just, people are often, when I find I'm talking to people about this, you will look at them. My, my another um, RRP trainer, Jen Vickers Kelly, and I were looking at a horse that she was picking up from auction. She does a bunch of rescuing. Um, and actually going to the auctions in Georgia and is there a thoroughbred, get it out. And when she gets it, she figures out, does the tattoo thing, backtracks, figures out who the horse is. And then she'll send me, I think this is who we've got. And we'll send the, um, this, you know, the pedigree. And, I'll, and sometimes we just look at it and we go, I don't know anything on it until you get back to, you know, a Northern dancer somewhere in the line or a secretariat somewhere in the line, but it's not anything in the last three generations we don't necessarily recognize or know is notable. So I feel like a lot of times we're looking for notable that comes with a little tag that has a temperament or a, a background to it. Um, and how much, you know, would like Northern Dancer in the fourth or fifth pedigree back, how much realistically is that going to be affecting the horse you have in front of you too? I feel like everyone has them in there, but like Northern Dancer's in almost every horse, so. That it, doesn't it? <laughs> it's, and then a good horse is a good horse and it doesn't, you know, at the end of the day, it doesn't damn well matter how well-bred they are uh, if they're just not talented or they suck as a, you know, their personality is terrible and you don't want to be around them. Um, but it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember who my vet was trying to tell me to, that I needed to buy the other day. So while somebody else tries, answers this, dives into the subjective 
mess that this is. I'll think of who yeah. he was trying to tell me that I needed to buy. So Caitlin, you come from, you know, a pretty privileged position in which you get to look at what well, you've looked at, what you've 1200 horses in the database right now. So you've looked at a lot of horses yourself with your own eyes, you know, performing in Western disciplines. So you've been able to form, I think, some firm opinions about who you see as a repeat sire. And I'm actually going to go ahead and open up this tab while you talk. Yeah, and I was actually working on updating that today, and we've got to almost 1,500 horses now. So you start to see a pattern, and I think it just kind of goes back to what I said before, because even though we have 1,500 horses in the database, there's only a few sires that really repeat and stand out. So the quarter horse thing, like I always go back to that for the for the Western horses. If you have a sire that is covering quarter horse mirrors, that's a good place to look. Um, for a Western prospect. And we see that a lot with um, horses that are standing in like Texas and Oklahoma and Louisiana. Like a lot of those stallions are also covering quarter horse mares and they just have a certain type. They tend to have a bigger hip, shorter cannons um, and just overall athletic appearance. And um, yeah, those, those are the horses I like to look for. So. Beyond that, I guess names that really stand out in our database would be uh, Swiss Yodeler. I haven't seen one of those that I didn't like. And I think he also um, does well siring event and jumper horses too. Um, he um, stood out in California for quite a while and his last, um, his last offspring would be older by now. I think they'd be 10 or eight to 10 now. So he's kind of, uh, dying out, but um, he was really exceptional. And then horses like Salt Lake, uh, uh, there's there's actually quite a few that pop up multiple times in our database that's um, just Some really the, nice. You know, nice like stuff. Alphabet Soup is right here in front of me right now. And I know that he's also very popular. He's about horse sire. You know, people come yeah, so you get a lot of horses that repeat just because they're out. popular. <laughs> yeah. Next week, he's the big celebration for his 30th birthday. Good for him. Oh, awesome. They're old friends. So what we're looking at right now, this is the Western Thoroughbreds database. So every horse that Caitlin's ever featured on the Western Thoroughbred, she puts into these databases and then has them organized, you know, in a couple different ways. So if you're looking to see what other horses of similar breeding are doing, um, she's got this organized by alphabetical list of jockey club name, year of birth, the state that they're in, and then of course by sire and dam sire and discipline. So that's going to be a really valuable tool if you're looking, in general, if you're looking at any horse for any discipline, but especially if you're looking for one in a Western discipline, just to see what other horses of similar breeding might be doing. Um, so this is a pretty valuable tool. Um, you can also take a look at our own thoroughbred sport tracker. That's the rrp.org slash TV sport tracker. Um, and it's not organized quite the same way as this, but you can still search by discipline and you can search by sire, grand sire, dam sire. I think you can directly search by dam maybe, um, but you can look and see what other horses of similar breeding are doing. So this is a, a, a nice way to start to do your own pedigree research. Um, if you think that there's certain lines you like, or you want to compare, you know, what your horse has in his pedigree and see what other horses of similar breeding are doing. Um, so that's my little plug for, for all the work that Caitlin's put into this, into the, the Western Thoroughbred database, but also into our own Thoroughbred Sport Tracker, which is a user-driven database. So people are putting in information themselves. So Julia, in your experience, do you have any favorite bloodlines that you like, either for second careers or on the track? Oh, there's so many. But I do remember there was a horse that stood around here called Horatius, and all of those were good riding horses after they were done. I mean, they were, they were um, very workmanlike and, and a lot of people had him because he was very prolific and he stood for a long, long time. Um, and just like, you know, there were some that were rotten. I mean, the one of the favorite horses I ever had was by a horse called Salutely that stood at Boniface and, and they all were a little rotten, but um, they could run, you know, so you put up with them. And there was always a joke with him when he came out to brew mares, they brought him out with a bit of honey because he was just to keep him sweet, sort of a thing. <laughs> um, so it'd be hard for me to pick a favorite one or two, really. 
Interesting. Yeah. And I think it's one of those things, you know, where the, the more horses you look at and the more horses you interact with, you know, you sort of start to, to fall in love with, you know, combinations of lines and, and certain things. I know, Julia, when we were looking at Jobber's pedigree once together and you pointed out, um, I think it's his grandsire on his damn side. And it also happens to be the same sire line as Mizzenmast. So now I'm already thinking. That's a really nice one. That's yeah. a really nice one. Yeah, I think Mizzenmast are pretty coveted for sport horse careers, but now it has me thinking about maybe looking for one the next time I'm in the market. So, you know. So yeah, you start thinking and writing down your favorites and going from there, so. And it kind of depends on what crosses, like, I don't know, I have so many that come through the barn. We just had two two-step salsas come through and never had heard of the sire before, um, but looked them up and, oh my gosh, those horses can jump and move. And now, I mean, I almost would be tempted if I see another one come up and it's sound, I would almost just buy off pedigree. It's, they're quirky, but wow like the jump on those horses is outrageous um and just in a really strange circumstance that i just had two um again both from jen that she picked up really randomly for like 500 dollars a piece off of an ad on facebook here or there and they turned out to be these outrageously nice horses I, the name is familiar and i wonder if it's in the third sport tracker because i've been looking at that a lot this month doing sire madness so i wonder if i've seen them in there but I feel like I've seen it somewhere and it's not a name that, you know, no, it's not remember, but it's not one that's in your mind, you know, as a great sire of resources at the moment. So Yikes. that's interesting. I know um, Flatter is starting to develop quite a fan club of people that are seeking out Flatter offspring. So um, another plug for our magazine, I think it was in our winter issue. Yep. In the winter issue. Uh, we did a piece on makeover horse searches and um, someone was so devoted to finding a flatter that they went super intense and they, you know, she did it very methodically, but she, she went through and found all the flatters that were running and, and figured out which one might be likely to retire and reached out and found the perfect horse for her. So, um, so definitely if people are willing to go to those lengths, then they must be onto something. So, so I think uh, flatter is, I think, an approved to be a, a sport horse sire over the next couple of years so so yeah it's interesting you know interesting stuff so um is there anything else that we did not cover that you guys think we need to touch on otherwise i'll just make sure we don't have any questions from folks if you stuck with us this long you must really like talking about pedigrees but we do we have people still watching so thanks for hanging out with us tonight but this is i mean we could talk about we could spend an entire day we could do a whole conference on how to research things on your thoroughbred, I think online, because there's so much information out there. And we're just really, I think, scratching the surface on how all these tools can interact. So I think it's interesting stuff. I'm gonna look more into dosage now after Aubrey gave us that tutorial. And hopefully yeah, I'm not completely wrong on it. <laughs> Caitlin, I think we should go through the Western thoroughbred database and start looking at dosage and see, see if there's a common thread there. Yeah, you can add that information yeah. if you would like. I can't imagine that was, it took me about three hours today just to add 80 more horses in there. So Yeah, we'll add that in all of our ample free time. <laughs> yeah. Dosage correlation with barrel racing horses and being sprinters. But I would speculate, you know, I mean, we've always, always said like, you know, sprinters tend, not always, but they tend to have the confirmation that, uh, that goes together. Oh, oh, okay. Here's a question from Tammy. Tips on how to find contact information for breeders just to get in touch or let them know how their babies have ended up. Um, so you can look on Equibase and you'll find your breeder. Um, that like public information, things like mailing addresses and phone numbers are not necessarily like available to the public with the Jockey Club. Um, your best bet is just to run farm names through Google and see if they've got you know, a, a website and you can shoot them an email. Um, some of the individual breeders that are just, you know, listed by name, it might be a little harder to track those people down, but um, yes, go cyberstalk. <laughs> it's a good place to start. Um, and this is one thing I will recommend, like some of the bigger Facebook groups for thoroughbreds, um, you know, you might be able to make connections there. You know, you might not be able to connect necessarily with the breeder themselves, but you might find, you know, someone who works for the breeder to be like, oh, yeah, definitely let me know. I might have baby pictures for you. Um, unfortunately, this is one of those things that is not like just out there for 
public consumption. So it's a little harder to track people down, you know, for obvious reasons, they don't want their phone numbers and mailing addresses out there. So, so yeah, you do have to sort of be a, a little bit of a sleuth sometimes um, to track those folks down. So, but you know, you never know what you find on Facebook. I managed to connect on Facebook friends with Jobber's old jockey. So he every now and then comments on pictures and says hello and calls him Billy, which I think is funny. Um, um, you know, and it's like, hey, Billy, good to see you happy. And I'm like, oh, thanks, Bryce. You know, thanks for bringing him home safe all those races ago. So, um, so yeah, I mean, definitely just look around Google, Facebook, and, you know, don't be afraid to send a polite email or a polite message. And then, you know, if you don't get the results you want, don't keep harassing people. <laughs> just be polite and uh, see what you can find. But yeah, good question. Um, another question that comes up a lot that I'll touch on real fast. If you're looking for wind photos for your horses, contact the track photographer because they will have all of that on file. Um, and you can usually find that on the track websites. So like if you know that your horse won at Keeneland, go to keeneland.com and you can track down the, the photographer that way and then go back through their records and you'll have to purchase that. But that's kind of a cool thing to have if that's something you're looking for. And a lot of the race farms will have that too. So they will have already purchased the wind photos. So Winchester, for instance, is awesome and sends those out if oh, they have nice. for the horses, um, which is really nice. And ooh, a quick thing, if you want baby pictures too, you can contact the auction that they sold through. So if they sold through a Keeneland sale and you know you can look up their hip number for what year they were sold, um, if they were in the yearling sales or the two-year-old sales, you can get their hip number and then you can email um, or contact the, um, they'll have some form of contact at the, for the auction and you're able to actually get in touch. And if they have pictures, you can either find them through the website or they can send them to you. I can't remember what ones make you purchase them or don't, but they should have them for most of the horses that did not sell out of auction. Mm -hmm. You can also purchase the whole video, I think, of their whole time in the ring. Um, and then too, you can also, some of the tracks have all of their races on YouTube or some of them have like a flash player on their website. So you can actually go back if you don't have that paid Equibase account to watch all those videos, you can go back and find those. So I've been able to find some of my guys on YouTube because the tracks put all of their races up. So depending on the track, you might be able to find races there. I think Woodbine might put everything, either Woodbine or maybe Woodbine. Either way, yeah, there's there, some of them you can, you know, find a, a track video, which is kind of fun, so. All right, folks. Well, I think that's all the questions from the audience. Um, if you guys are watching this on demand later and you do have questions, definitely um, feel free to send us an email at info at the rrp.org. Uh, if you drop a comment on the video, I'll do my best to keep up with them, but it's a little hard to track them down after the fact. So, um, so if you don't get an answer right away, definitely I recommend email is the best way to get in touch with us. Um, but thank you guys for, that means thank you, Julia, Aubrey, and Caitlin for hanging out with us tonight and sharing your knowledge. And I think all we did was really scratch the surface. I think we could go on about this for days. Oh, for sure. It's a fun topic. It really is. Next time we do it, we'll all go to the track and then, you know, we'll. Hopefully we'll be able to sit and have a decent sort of lunch while we go yeah, at some point in the near future, which would be something to look forward to. Huh? Yeah. Over I'm not, I'm not going to the track without Julia. No. Yeah, I think that's a, the greatest takeaway lesson for tonight is we're going to the track with Julia next time. Well, that sounds fun. Good. I can't wait. I really can't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks very much. Have a lovely evening and we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.